Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Crystal Jordan and I'm the host for Rolling Out and you are joining Sisters with Superpowers, a conversation with Black Women's Health Initiative. And I'm so excited uh, to have all of you join us tonight. We know this is a conversation that's much needed. And so it's a great opportunity for us to come together with other women of color and have a conversation that affects us all. So we have an amazing panelist. I'm going to introduce them. And you guys, we're going to have an amazing conversation all about women's sexuality, our health and sexuality. So please help me welcome to the panel tonight. We have Ladia Joyce. She is an HIV uh, positive influencer and founder of The Positive Experience. From compelling nonprofit founder to confident fashionista, Ladia brings truth and light to the miseducation of HIV and its stigma in the Black community. She creates uh, that she creates for cisgender Black women. She's living out loud with an HIV diagnosis while using the power of storytelling and transparency to embolden women, irrespective of their status, from all walks of life to do the same. She is a proud member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. And her formal education includes music industry, business communications, and marketing. Welcome, Ladia Joyce. Hey, y'all. Thank you for having me. And my puppy just entered the room. So I'm a... <laughs> You like puppies. <laughs> okay. Up next, we have Wendasha Jenkins Hall, also known as the sensible sex pert. You all, if you follow her on Instagram, which I do, that is her, that is her Instagram moniker. But she is a champion, judgment free, and a champion's judgment free and pleasure based conversations about sexuality that unabashedly center modern Black women and femmes. So, we definitely needed to have uh, you on this panel so we can have some real conversation. Known for her down to earth delivery, she slays stereotypes and misinformation surrounding female sexuality while holding space for women and femmes to live their best sexual lives. Can we get an amen? <laughs> Dr. Wendasha earned a bachelor's in journalism from the University of Central Florida, a master's in communication management from Morgan State University, and a PhD in public health education from the University of North Carolina Greensboro. Again, help me welcome Wendasha Jenkins Hall. Thank you for having me. I really am excited about this and doing some great work with Rolling Out and on the Black Women's Health Imperative. So I'm I'm ready. You're Roll. ready. <laughs> All right. And last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Linda Sprague Martinez. She's an associate professor and former chair of the Macro Social Work Pr Practice Department of Boston University School of Social Work. She is interested in examining asset based strategies to tackle health inequities, such as community engaged research approaches like community based participatory research and youth-led participatory action research um, are all central to her work. In 2017, she was a Boston Housing Authority Center for Community Engagement and Civil Rights Resident Empowerment Coalition honoree. That is a mouthful. <laughs> but <laughs> Sorry. <we welcome. laughs> Dr. Linda Sprague Martinez, welcome. Well, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you all. And um, I'm excited to hear my colleagues in the in the other squares and what they have to say. I'm <laughs> expecting to learn a lot. Um, exciting about the, tonight's topic. So. Well, again, this is all brought by Black Women's Health Imperative and Rolling Out. This is Sisters with Superpowers. And I love the fact that this conversation is happening because so often Right now, we have conversations going on social media, and so much of that conversation consists of sexuality and what we're doing, but very rarely do we talk about sexual health. There seems to be a gap between the two. So I'm just going to ask you all um, up front as we come here and, and, and talk about this, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that you hear and deal with in your everyday lives and practices when it comes to Black women's sexuality and Black women's sexual health? We'll start with you, uh, Dr. Wendasha. Ooh, that is, what do I hear? <laughs> so um, one thing that I, I tend when it comes to sexual health is that we tend to separate sexual health from sexual pleasure, mm -hmm. right? And um, I think that is one of the biggest mistakes that we, we tend to make because when we're talking about sexual health, a lot of times with Black women, we look at it from a deficit model, 
right? So we're looking at it just negative. Everything is negative. We all look at it from a disease perspective. So we're looking at it from, okay, if you have sex, you're going to catch a disease, you're going to die, right? And that is not the case. Um, I think that the conversations that we have around pleasure, they are absent of the health aspect as well. So that's really what I tend to see that we don't have that uh, congruence or we don't have that merging of both saying, yes, sex is good. Sex is healthy. Sex is pleasurable and offering ways to make sure that we stay healthy at having sex. It doesn't have to always be um, doom and gloom when it comes to sex. It doesn't have to be either or. It's and, right? So we sex, we can have this amazing sex and we can be healthy about it. It doesn't have to be this either or situation that we tend to frame our sexuality, our sexual health in. So that's what I tend, that's what I tend to see most often. Absolutely. Ladia, what about you? And, and what about the fact that we, you know, what, what Dasha said was so important. We, we don't really, I think we hear uh, women talking about sex in music, but it's very mm -hmm. rare that we actually hear black women or women of color able to step up and say, yes, I enjoy sex. Sex is pleasurable. Sex is a good thing. It still has that stereotype that, you know, a woman shouldn't necessarily admit how much she really enjoys sex. I would say it's the both and. Again, like um, Doc said, are y'all getting feedback? <laughs> no, okay. I would say like Doc said, it's, a, it's that both and. And when black women tend to have their both and, and not the either or, mm -hmm. a lot of the misconceptions, the stigma, the stereotypes, stem from that, especially mm -hmm. as someone who lives their life out loud with an HIV diagnosis, I'm not supposed to date. I'm not supposed to have pleasurable sexual experiences. I'm not supposed to still be able to see sex as a pleasurable thing, right? Mm -hmm. And also to answer the original question, the black women don't understand and see their vulnerability when it comes to HIV. And I would say that would be one of the biggest things and one of the largest deficits, gaps, whatever the word you want to put there, that you see when it comes to our vulnerability, the way we sex, how we sex, and how that tends to lead us to be more, to be diagnosed with STIs and STDs. Mm. Mm, yes. That was that was deep, I, and I don't think I have, that's deep. I, I want I want to come back to that because I think there's there's some there's some more that we can do in that discussion about you know our vulnerability when it comes to because I don't think that a lot of women of color see themselves as vulnerable. Period. <laughs> Let alone when it comes to sexuality and and sexual health. Um, Dr. Linda, what about you? What do you think? What do you see most often? Uh, what are the biggest misconceptions for you when it comes to uh, women's sexual health? Yeah, I think all the points that um, when Dasha and Ladia mentioned, and then also one of these things that happens in the healthcare experience is it becomes a conversation about, not about sexual health, but about reproductive health, right? Mm -hmm. And so not every conversation about sexual health needs to be a conversation about reproductive health, and because that, that means we're not having conversations about sex, and it means that conversations have to do with reproduction, but really we miss that part. I think that when Dasha mentioned around pleasure and all the other pieces of sexuality. So I think that that's an important piece as well, kind of untangling those pieces and then. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So when Dasha, you do, you talk about this with women on Instagram all the time and on your social media platforms. I, you know, what do you think women think? What is the definition of women's sexual health? When you hear, when women hear that, that term, do you think they understand the, 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 I guess, how large and how, you know, how much that covers? Like um, Linda said, a lot of it is people think of, rep, you know, reproductive health and, and health. There's a lot of conversation about, you know, women of color and, and being able to, you know, fertility issues. But when yes. it comes to just actually enjoying sex and having sex positive conversations, where do you find most of the conversation lies? So when we think about sexual health, I always like to tell women that sexual health is not simply the absence of disease, 
right? So we tend to frame it as, okay, yes, you go get tested. Yes, you use condoms or yes, you use some type of contraception if you're not um, trying to get pregnant. So we we go through all of those things. So yes, we talk about um, fertility and all of those things. Those things are important. However, that is just one aspect of sexual health. One thing we don't tend to talk a lot about when it comes to sexual health is our relationships. Are we having healthy relationships? Mm -hmm. Who are we having relationships with? Because who we're having sex with, like Ladia said, who we're sexing and how we're sexing, that makes a difference. So we don't talk about the emotional aspects of sex, right? We don't talk about the mental aspects of sex. We just tend to we really only focus on the the mechanics, right? So what people are doing in the bedroom or what they should not do in the bedroom if they don't want to get pregnant or if they don't want to contract the disease or whatnot. Uh -huh. So I think that when I talk to women, I'm saying sexual health is so much more. Yes. So are you having the sex you want to have with who you want to have it with? And <laughs> is this pleasurable? Is it adding to your life? Because if it's not, then why are you having that sex, right? Mm -hmm. Are you having sex because you're trying to please a partner? You want that partner to do something for you? Or are you having sex because this is something that's driven by you? This is something that you desire. Uh -huh. So I, because a lot of the conversations I have around sex is, okay, Dr. Dr. Wandasha, I, I've never had an orgasm before. And then they, I turn around and tell them, well, you're responsible for your orgasm. Right. So we're so busy in the bedroom trying to please our partner. We take all of these different classes. I'm just going to be frank. No, um, we have a lot of head classes. We have a lot of how to ride classes, which is great. Up your skill. But is your partner taking um, Kundalini's classes or how to eat you out or how to stroke good? No, because we as women and femmes, we're taught that we are supposed to be givers. We're supposed to be nurturers. And so we give so much of ourselves that we tend to forget who we are and what we need in the process. So that's why I think that we just need to have a broader conversation. It's not just about disease. It's not just about pregnancy prevention. It's about having healthy relationships. It's about having good sex. It's also about exploring yourself sexually, even when it comes to different kinks and fetishes that you may have or exploring your sexual orientation, even your sexual identity. We don't even talk about that. So. I am a person, I like to look at it holistically. We have to have a holistic view of it. So that's why I think the conversation needs to go, how we need to drive it. And a lot of times our doctors, so when the women go to their doctors or their healthcare providers, sex is only disease or pregnancy prevention. Mm -hmm. They're not even asking you. So when you're having sex, does it hurt? Does it feel good? Right. You know, how can I help you have the sex that you need and want to have? So I didn't want to go, I, I don't want to. Oh, no, perfect. Going. That's exactly. Going. <laughs> if you were, if, I know that this is not a poetry reading, but I, I, I felt like snapping because you are saying exactly what, you know, we know is happening in this, in, in our community. And I want to ask, you know, Ladia also and Linda, just kind of piggybacking on what Wendasha said. So often we are not talking about sex in real terms. We're talking about it in <laughs> clinical terms, like, by the time a lot of women go to their OBGYN with a problem, they've held it in so long because there's still a sense of shame. And we're not talking about the fact that so many women are not having pleasurable, healthy sex, especially women of color, because in our communities, that's not been something that women have been um, privy to talk about. We can talk about what we're going to do to our partner and how we can, you know, there's a line in a rap song, I can make a Sprite can disappear in my mouth. But that, so that's all for the partner. But what about, for ourselves and making sure that we're actually enjoying healthy, positive sex, uh, sexual health and, se and sexual lives. I'm gonna ask both of uh, Ladia and uh, Linda to speak to that. I will say one thing I'm very big on is the pleasure principle. Like before we even have sex, do you make me feel good outside the bedroom? Mm -hmm. If it's not pleasurable to me outside the bedroom, there's no guarantee you're going to give me pleasure inside the bedroom and pleasure for you can be a myriad of things mm -hmm. but those myriad of things impact and affect how you show up sexually because if he's not doing for you pleasurably outside the bedroom then you sex become more performative mm -hmm. and this is like you're performing for an audience to get a buy-in, especially women of a certain age. We don't want to push them away. 
We don't want to exercise our efficacy or our advocacy. We want to don't want to ask about the most recent test results. We don't want to be fervent in asking for condom usage. Mm -hmm. So it's just like that whole wraparound pleasure principle. Does he talk to you the right way? If he didn't answer that question about the test results, since why are you laying down with him? <laughs> and that's how I like to think about it. And a lot of times speaking to women who may have been diagnosed with some type of incurable STI and STD, a lot of times they forget about the pleasure present. The mm -hmm. pleasure principle, I'm sorry, I got my retainers in. The pleasure <laughs> principle, they forget about that. It's like, mm -hmm. no, sis, your parts still work. Mm -hmm. Your vagina still does, it's going to vagina. <laughs> Everything <laughs> else is still going to do what it's going to do. What of that pleasure? Yeah. The pleasure principle. And I think those same conversations that we're not having outside of the bedroom with our partners, we're not having with our doctors, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of that has to do with the way, I don't know if I have a little bit of an echo or... But a lot of that has to do with the way that the system is designed. You know, are we in relationship with our providers, right? When you're going in to talk to your doctor, your body's changing. Are you talking about that? Are you talking about um, what you're experiencing in the bedroom? Are you having those conversations? And that's really sometimes hard to think about in a 15 minute meeting with someone who doesn't see you as human or doesn't, if you're, you know, depending on your relationship with your provider, what the interpersonal aspects of care look like. And so I think that's a, another piece as well is where are we having the conversations? If we're not having them outside the bedroom with our partner, we're not having them with the provider, like maybe they're not happening. So mm -hmm. well, if you're just tuning in, this is Sisters with Superpower, uh, powered by Rolling Out and in a partnership with the Black Women's Health Imperative. And we have a superstar panel today because we're talking about Black women's sexual health. And actually, we just talked about a little bit about, of course, there's the pleasure principle, as Ladia said, and there's also the health aspect. And so, Ladia, I want to ask you, because as someone that is living out loud uh, with, a, with the HIV diagnosis, what there's a huge disconnect when it comes to um, health equity and care for women of color in the medical field. We've heard doctors talk about that. Um, and I think, you know, it's almost like after the, the issues that we went through as a country racially, a few years ago, people started being more um, vocal about that dis disparities in so many different places. And so this is one when it comes to women's health. And we see that black women or women of color are not getting the same help. They're not getting the same opportunities based on either economics or just race, religion. Can you talk a little bit about what that disparity is and what that disconnect looks like and how it affects our community? You, you asked a, a, a heavy one, sis. When you think about it like this, when it comes to Black women specifically and HIV, by the time we are done with this, this live, three women would have been diagnosed with HIV in 90 minutes. Two of those three women would have been Black women. We make up 64% of all HIV diagnoses each year. So just that sheer number alone, if we contracted HIV at the same rate as white women contracted it, there'd be a 93% decrease in the number of transmissions across this country when it comes to black women and HIV. Those numbers alone show the disparities black women when it comes to HIV transmissions. A lot of that is steeped in just how our community views HIV. When we think about the history of HIV, it was birth or it was draped underneath this guise of being a gay white man's disease. Very quickly, the narrative shifted at the top of the 2000s when black women for the first time became the first population women period to be um, diagnosed at these alarming rates. But uh, so much of it is steeped in how we're socialized with sex how we don't have those conversations like Dr. Martinez just said, how we look at sex as either disease-free or a mechanism for pregnancy. We're told at a very early age, don't come home pregnant. But no one told us not how to come home pregnant. Because if you had had that whole question, whole, excuse me, whole conversation, you would have taught me how not to come home pregnant and how to remain my most healthy and um, safest self. 
safest self, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the lack of those wraparound conversations and not making sure we have the skill sets instilled in us from a child is making us so very vulnerable. And then propaganda makes us feel like we have to do what we have to do to get the attention and the love from our black kings. Because if we don't, then we're gonna be by ourselves. We're not gonna be loved. We're gonna be touch deficient. And just all that wraps around and how we view or don't view the vulnerability that we have when it comes to HIV. Mm -hmm. That those numbers are heartbreaking, and it seems like they, you know, we we continue to be ahead, so far ahead. You know, the disconnect is so huge with our community. I want to ask you, um, Dr. Linda, can you tell us a little bit, you know, kind of piggybacking on what Ladia just shared about what you found out in your research um, as it relates to really advancing health equity across the board? Yeah, you know, I mean, one of the things and and that we know in research is that healthcare health care inequities exist, right? They, they exist. We all have different experiences with the system. And I was reading something the other day. Um, back in the day, I used to work for the Office of Minority Health for years. And um, at the time, it was, you know, early 2000s, this report came out at the time, it was monumental. Maybe some of you all remember that that um, it was um, unequal treatment. And, you know, it talked about provider bias and stereotyping and how how could it be, that, you know, well-meaning, there were headlines like, how could it be that well-meaning providers contribute to inequities? And for many of us, we were like, how could it not be? We live in the same society. Mm -hmm. We drink the same water. We get the same messages. How mm -hmm. could it not be that people aren't biased and we're not experiencing these inequities? Um, um, and recently, because now I realize it's been 20, you know, 20 years later and, and things haven't changed. Healthcare inequities still exist. Right. And that when we look at who's reached, a lot of times people used to use the frames around hard to reach populations and that we black women would be hard to reach populations. But the reality is that we're hardly reached. We are hardly reached populations. And it's not because the system is broken. It's because the system was not designed to reach us. Right. And so mm -hmm. we need to kind of be thinking about those things is that our, in order to really begin to engage, be, engage in treatment, systems need to change. Right. We need to be mm -hmm. seen as human. We need to be seen as whole. And we need to start to think about what does it take? Um, what does what do communities need to look like in order for people to actually engage with treatment and services? What do um, healthcare systems need to look like? What does transportation need to look like? What does housing need to look like? All of those things. What is it? What does that need to look like for us to be able to engage in meaningful care? Um, and so, some of the, you know, one of the things the work that I do is really about, well, who has the answers to those questions? Black women, right? And, and black women with HIV have the answer to the questions in terms of how we need to design the system to make it work. Right. And so we need to be at the table making decisions, reconfiguring care, reconfiguring communities um, if, if it's going to work for us. So those are some of the pieces. Um, we definitely want to hear more. How can how can I guess the, the community as a whole support the work that you're doing, Dr. Linda, because this is not something that um, this is something that we need to attack holistically, as when Dasha mm -hmm. kind of alluded to earlier. It's not a conversation that we just need to have with our doctors or with our OBGYNs or with our, you know, at the, if it gets to another point or fertility uh, specialists. This is something that the community has to really embrace. So what can we do to help with the programs that you're doing to get women, first of all, familiar with them? And then what are some of the other strategies that you all have that we can help support? Yeah, I would say one thing is to get involved, talk to your providers. There's all those things. I've been working with this initiative most recently that I'm super excited about. Um, it's funded by the Health um, Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, and it's a special project of national significance, SPINS, all these acronyms, HRSA SPINS. Um, I'm not good with alphabet soup. It wasn't when I worked for the state, not when I worked for the academy. And it's um, improving, um, improving care and treatment coordination for Black women. And there are 12 demonstration sites across, across the country that are doing really great work um, implementing not just one intervention, but bundled interventions. And one of the things that I think one way to get involved that we don't always think about is, you know, different community advisory boards, patient advisory boards, get involved in your healthcare organization on different, and that can be within within healthcare, there are ways to get involved in boards, but also in other, other um, areas as well. And, you know, there are barriers to that. When do boards meet? Well, why is it? You know, I work with a hospital. And why is it that a hospital that serves a majority of um, 
population people of color has a majority white board. Well, who has free time? Why are we having the meeting in the middle of the day? But just kind of pushing with those questions and also getting involved in organizing and activism. That's key to it as well, right? So in getting involved in healthcare, um, in health with the healthcare interventions and on health on boards um, so that you're involved in decision making and, and really asking your provider, you know, I, how can I get more involved in, in really engaging, but um, getting involved also in local action. That's key because we need to make change on the inside, but we need to make it on the outside as well. So. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to go back to the sensible sex part of <laughs> Dasha here because you're actually talking to women, like I said, through your uh, Instagram page. Like I said, I, I follow it. You just had a baby recently. So this is all a part of you know what you're what you're going through in real time. Can you talk a little bit about how your personal experience kind of shapes the passion that you have for this work and where that motivation came from. So um, I tell people I've been doing this since I was like 16 years old. So I've been um, working in this field from that age. Um, I actually started out doing um, HIV peer education in my hometown of Tallahassee, Florida. And I was there educating teens and grown folk too about um, HIV. I have family members um, who were living with HIV. And that is how I got involved because they told me this is, this is something that you can prevent, but at the same time, it's not something that you need to walk in fear of. And by them telling me that I felt that it was something that I should do. It was something, even though, um, there were men in my life who were living with HIV, I started to see women, right. That were living with HIV, but we, we weren't even addressing that. It was more so at the time we're gonna we're gonna focus on gay men and i was like but no black women are you know suffering from this too this is an issue that we see too and as i got a little bit older and started reading a little bit more i had to call a thing a thing and when we look at our sexuality we have to address how much of our sexuality is shrouded in racism respectability politics so we're told, like Lydia said, from a from a young age, you should not do this, you should not do that, because we're trying to uphold some image of what black womanhood should be. So if you are a respectable black woman, you're not supposed to be out there doing fast things. So calling little girls and young girls fast, saying don't wear the red nail polish or the red lipstick because you don't want to be looked at a certain type of way. And so I started to see that because of those things, black women and black girls, we weren't taught to grow up and experience and embrace our sexuality in a holistic way and for what it really is and how it can be truly beautiful and benefit us. We were taught to be afraid of it. So that is why I started to really make this my life work. So I, I'm currently in the academy. I'm a professor, but I know that the work that I do, I, I wanted to have, I wanted to translate. So yes, I write the articles. Yes, I do the research. But what I'm doing on my day to day, I started to see that the women who I'm talking to and having conversations with, they're not getting that, right? So we have to have some direct translation. And the way I'm talking now, the way I talk on a sensible sex part, I can't write that up in a, in a journal article. I can't um, go to the presentation at you know, American Public Health Association and do that. But I knew that I could leverage social media. I knew that I can leverage these other platforms to do that because I'm t a person that likes to speak truth to power. And I want women to experience their sexuality holistically. Don't be afraid of it. No, you're not a dirty woman. No, you are a not, you're not fast because you like certain things. You know, instead of stigmatizing, oh, so you're into this sex act. Well, how can we help make that healthier for you? How can we help make that safer for you so you can go out and enjoy and do what you want to do? Okay, you have multiple sex partners. No, sis, I'm not going to call you a hoe. No, you're just enjoying yourself and living your best life. How about we just get some testing in there? How about we use condoms? How about, you know, you let your partners know that, you know, let's go get tested together. And if you're not down with that, then, you know, you can't be on my team. You can't, you can't be a play on the team. I got to drop you, right? So these are things that, are okay that we shouldn't normalize people express their sexuality in different ways and i want um black women and femmes to know that we should have the freedom to do what we do sexually like white women do 
right? So we should be able to say, I enjoy having sex. We should be able to say that sex brings me a freedom. Sex allows me to share my myself with people who I love and care about without that fear, without that stigma, without that shame. Because, because, because like I said, because of racism and respectability, that also spills over into the doctor's office, right? So we have these medical providers who look at black women and our sexuality through a pathological lens. So if we were to come in to get tested and if there was to be some positive test of some sort in their subconscious minds, they can be like thinking, well, that's a black woman. Mm -hmm. They're being fast anyway. They're being promiscuous anyway, because they are holding on to these stereotypes that were rooted in slavery where we were just basically breeders, right? And they justified the rape and the molestation and abuse of our bodies because they said that we were fast and that we were wanting it. So they dehumanized us and we still have that dehumanizing element in the medical system. So I really try to hit that on different points. So that's that's really how I got the passion for it. Just, just seeing a lot of things going on, understanding that yes, I'm a researcher. Yes, I'm in the academy, but at the same time, I need to be speaking to my sisters. That's every day. That's not going to be reading that journal article. Who I'm on the streets. This process here. Hey, sis, nice hair. Are you being safe, safe sex in the day? Like I want to have that conversation. And so that is really how I just started to approach it. Just talk real about it. Talk about relationships talk about sex so if you're into whatever sex act whatever kink okay let's talk about it i'm there with you but let's see what we can do to keep you healthy to keep you safe and also keep you happy we don't talk a lot about happiness when it comes to sex so that that is something that i also try to hit on like do what makes you happy do what brings you pleasure do what makes you feel good Mm -hmm. and so that is how i like to approach it on the sensible sex bird but still kind of do my (laughs) my work on the side which i actually have work that um is coming out where we're talking about researching um black black people living with aids in their experiences of discrimination in healthcare settings so what is it like even in 2022 what is it like to step into a doctor's office and they know that you have hiv are you getting care that is equitable and if not why is that and instead of trying to do another intervention for black people living with hiv we need to be doing some interventions for these doctors right because we're always trying to fix um us we're like oh we need to fix something about black people living with hiv or we need to fix something about black women no let's fix the system and the people who are supposed to be providing care for them so i try to hit it on different fronts um i don't know if that answered your question it did it I did and then out of every time but <laughs> it did but i i first of all i you know that what you your answer there were so many levels to that that we could just talk about so many of those topics for the entire hour number one when you said you know black girls are fast it took me all the way back to being like you know, going through puberty and hearing mm-hmm. my mother tell me, oh, well, you can't wear certain things because of the way your body is shaped. Men are going to mm-hmm. look at you and think that you're sexual. So I already felt something was wrong. Started from the gate, you know, mm-hmm. and that's just a part of our, it's been a part of our culture for so long. And I appreciate the fact that we're talking now, we're now having these type of conversations because so many women of color have been living in, you know, living in shame and living in, you know, condemnation of themselves because of something that's very natural that our bodies were created to do. So the work that you guys are all doing is so important and a huge kudos to the Black Women's Imperative for actually having the foresight to bring together a panel of women to talk with us and not at us. And that's what this conversation has been thus far. Um, When Dasha going into the conversation of where this all comes from, you know, and a lot of that is woman to woman, right? Our, my mother told me that when I was young, that this is, that you're wearing this and this is going to make you look this way. I want to, I want to pivot over to Ladia because you are, as I said, someone living with, with HIV. And also we talked a little bit about the stereotypes. We talked about how women can do that to each other. Ladia, what are your thoughts when you hear some of the things that, that black men say about black women, you know, <laughs> what are your thoughts and how can we start to change and educate them as well because there is this stereotype that if a black woman enjoys or a woman of color enjoys sex you know enjoys sex and is honest about it she's 
you know, there's some words that we're not going to say today, but, you know, she's loose, she's this, she's that. But yet that's also praised. So it's like a, con, you know, it's a contradiction. And a lot of young women and, and actually not even young women, just women are living as a prisoner of that contradiction, those stereotypes. So, Ladia, what, what do you see and what where can we go in educating our men to be understanding and come, you know, come along with us, you know, come on with us in the 20 in 2022? <laughs> Oh, girl, you said black man, educating <laughs> at the intersectionality of education and sex and liberation. Girl, you do you have it. the time? <laughs> um, and just the conversations I have, because using my social media platform, they won't never ask the questions in front of IG where people can see mm -hmm. on a DM. And their mentality Sometimes I want to be like, baby, who taught you? I'm like, did you really pay attention even in the sexual health class we got in junior high? And it's a huge disconnect because, again, it goes back to them seeing sex for, or the result of sex, two things, performative for my, or as a result, mechan the mechanics of sex. When you enter or interject pleasure into the conversations, they freak out. And how do you change that? Continue to have open, honest dialogue with ourselves as sisters. Get emboldened from conversations with your sisters. And then have those conversations with your partners. Because I don't think that they can be changed. I think it's one of those things they have to be socialized with. And the more that we ease up having the conversation, the more I want to say the same. Because they're very open and honest, loud, filled with bravado, machismoism when it comes to sex. They tell you how they want it. They're going to blow your back out. They're going to bust it wide open. It's all real harsh and ain't nothing cute, nice, soft, feminine, safe, secure about that. Which won't change until our language change. Their lack of conversation is not going to change until we start having the conversation. I have the conversations from the get go for one, because I have to interact with them, especially in dating. I got to have a conversation. I chose to shift my narrative and my perspective and how I have the conversation. I'm not going to have this conversation from a seat of condemnation or shame. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have this conversation standing flat-footed in my pleasure and also being able to disseminate the information that I need you to understand for us to take it to the next level. <laughs> and you can't do that as a sister, being concerned about how other people are going to want to view you. Because if you put yourself first, your pleasure first, it doesn't matter what has to happen with the reason for that to be a pleasurable experience that's within your barriers, within your guidelines. So to get them to come along, like sis, they still think we getting HIV by ourselves or that we getting HIV from sleeping with a gay man. Mm -hmm. And I was in a relationship with one gay, but okay, sir, go off, right? So until we shift the conversation and the narrative and our perspective with ourselves first, they gonna continue to be that way. Well, in that, I want to stay right there for a second, uh, Ladia, because what you what you do is so needed, and there's there's so many stereotypes. That last one you said, everyone assumes we still have the stigma that this is a this is a gay man's disease, you know virus or disease, and that's obviously not true. And so I want to just keep it right there for a second. And also, it's also been thought of as a death sentence, you know, or at least a, a death sentence for your sexual life, right? So can you talk a little bit about just the day-to-day -day process of living and what are the care options for someone that is living with HIV or AIDS now? What is, you know, kind of give us a little insight into the fact of uh, what that what that feels like for you, what, what that's like when you have, when you meet someone or when you're talking with another uh, woman who is dealing with it and now is going to have to date um with this with this conversation that's probably heavy on her shoulders before she even even starts what are some what are some options in the light at the end of that tunnel 
you you ask a lot, <laughs> but I'm gonna start with as I actually have to have this conversation later on tonight once I'm done with this live. It's a new boo, new bay. So I have to have the disclosure conversation tonight. It never gets easy. Having mm -hmm. the actual conversation, it gets easy. I'm looking at six years in September. But the emotional impact of that conversation, it doesn't change. It's still heavy. But I had to reconcile within myself that I desire to be loved, to be partnered. And it's just one of the necessary evils, for lack of better words, that I have to persevere through in order to get a relationship. But I don't have that conversation from shame or condemnation. Disclosure is one of those conversations. It's a two-way street. Brother, you gonna have to disclose some stuff. I'm gonna have to disclose some stuff. My disclosure just is a little bit different than what I disclose. So that disclosure piece in dating is a, is a point of contention for a lot of women who've been diagnosed because of the, the, the vitriol that we can get. Because again, we're talking about those stereotypes and the closed mindedness of black men. For the willfulness, the willful ignorance that they have when it comes to HIV. So it's crazy that you asked about that because I literally am getting off of this, going to get dressed and meeting him for dinner. So yeah. So that's just one of the things, like you date, but you have to have those conversations. And even in that conversation, I still ask, all right, brother, slide your test results ac across the table. Cause I still gotta know. You wanna know yeah. mine? I wanna know yours. Um, day to day, the options, thank God, that the medical advancements when it comes to um, medication. Because I take one pill a day, but every time I take that pill, I'm reminded that I'm HIV positive. HIV positive. So th it's just navigating and pushing through the internalized and external stigma because it gets heavy. Mm -hmm. For those who may watch this, who've been diagnosed, there is a light in the tunnel. I'm not the one who's going to say that it does not feel like death. When I hear people say, oh, but it's not a death sense sentence, Something in you died the day that you were diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Something in you for the good died or something in you for the bad died, but something's going to die. When people say it's not a death sentence, you don't know how close to death I felt before getting on medication or how close to a mental death I went through because as a black woman diagnosed with HIV at 36, that's a lot to process. Yeah. And again, internal and external stigmas become heavy. And then you think about how we were socialized uh, with HIV, especially being 80s babies. Mm -hmm. And you fight your whole life not to be a statistic, to become yeah. a statistic. So uh, there is life in the tunnel, but I'm not the one, I'm not toxic positivity. No yes. real positivity. Like, mm -hmm. sis, it's going to be some days you're going to get heavy get your tribe together, get you a good medical team together. Part of your medical team is a therapist. Jesus and therapist saved my life, like together. <laughs> you know, like you have to be real with yourself and put yourself first. Cause your health, your total health, your wraparound health is mm -hmm. paramount. And everybody mm -hmm. else be down. Mm -hmm. Put yourself first, absolutely. I. Well, first of all, I want to say, uh, Ladia, from all of us and, and, and Black Women Health Imperative and, and Rolling Out, we, we so appreciate you being so honest. This is definitely going to help other women out there. Your honesty and the fact that you are sharing your story in real time is, is so powerful. And so we just we honor you for doing that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Dr. Linda, that, that brings me to you, because obviously listening to you, yeah, it's apparent how urgent, you know, advanced research is for this for this uh, situation, especially when it comes to women of color with HIV. What are, what are the urgent needs from your end? And again, how can people become more more aware and support, you know, so that we don't have, you know, a, a, every what nine, ninety minutes three three women of color, you know, being diagnosed. What can we do, and how can we, you know, help and support what you're doing to to, to yeah. research. 
I think, uh, Wendasha, you said it so well earlier. I, I think this idea that, you know, a lot of what we do is we're focusing on women directly, which we need to changing women, but we need to be changing systems. And we don't just need to be changing healthcare systems. When you were talking, Ladia, I kept thinking about the messages that we get. We don't just get them like from our families. Like the mm -hmm. minute we get into school, like who's a good student, right? Like who's a good student? You're quiet, you sit there you smile, right? Like you're not challenged, especially like I went to title one schools, you know, so, you know, in title one schools, good students smile, sit there and smile in private, you know, independent schools, you're challenging the teacher. Like if I did that in my school, I'd be out, <laughs> you know, there wouldn't be like, I'd be out and in trouble. But, you know, so I think even the way, like the messages we get in our families, they're reinforced. And that's all, that's the structural racism, right? That's the fact that, we live in two very different worlds and we are schooled to act a certain way. And we need, and the challenge is, is that to uphold our economic system, like it's like racism and capitalism are married, right? And so, you know, that racial capitalism, we need to kind of keep that in check, in balance. And so it, it's, it's on the one, it's so, it feels so big, right? On the one hand, yeah, we want to do interventions. We want to talk about stigma. We want to talk about work at the individual, but we need to talk about changing systems. We need to talk about, um, changing our education systems. We need to talk about changing our economic systems and our healthcare systems because they're so tied. I mean, uh, healthcare systems are so tied. I was also um, thinking, Wendisha, the point you were making about like what we write in the journal versus what we write in the in the when, what we talk about online online i'm kind of low tech so i'm not always talking online but but i'm talking to people in the community or <laughs> you know i it's it, it there are two different languages but then there's this reality that our research it sits on a shelf for 17 years before it's translated mm -hmm. like that's problematic um it's problematic that we fund large institutions like mine i work in a large institution more so than we're funding communities so, right we need to think about you know, research that happens in partnership with communities. Like if I'm asking mm -hmm. the questions by myself, then that's not going to be helpful. We need mm -hmm. to be funding community-based organizations, grassroots leaders mm -hmm. in partnership with researchers um, so that we're, you know, so that we are doing research that's actually meaningful, that's going to lead to some kind mm -hmm. of change, right? Because really the conversation you're having online, researchers need to hear that because the questions we're asking aren't the right questions. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that we need to rethink as a, as a research community, the way we operate, the way we do business, the way our institutions operate, because right now all they do is uphold the status quo. And, the, and that doesn't work for any of us. So I think th those are some things that are popping into my mind, listening to the conversation. Um, I know we're, we're, we're getting close to, to being out of time, but I just want to say just from a personal, you know, being a woman in her forties, if I could go back and talk to, my younger self before I became sexually active and when all these stereotypes were first being created and formed within me, if I could go back and tell that crystal, I would tell her there's nothing wrong with her and that the feelings that she has, she does not need to hide. They're not, they're not bad. She should talk to her. I should talk to my mom or talk to my daughter. I, my doctor, I wish I had um, the ability to go back in time, right. And tell that, you know, teenage crystal that, this is, there's nothing wrong with you. You, this is something that's beautiful that you should, that you are created. Like it's a part of your, your, your DNA. You're supposed to enjoy that, that stigma. I, I did not, I did not learn that, you know, growing up because I grew up in a very, very religious uh, uh, family and household that was very uh, conservative. And so I learned to hide my feelings and I had to learn so much of that um, later through reading or asking questions to friends or just watching television. So I wish that that teenage crystal had heard this conversation, you know, um, I wish that black women's health imperative had been around. <laughs> and so this kind of conversation would be had. So I want to ask three of you before we leave, what would you have uh, wanted to tell your younger self when it comes to sexuality and sexual health? If you could go back in time to when you were a teenager, a preteen, and first learning your body and learning um, about what was expected of you and what you expected from others. What is that message that you would like to teach uh, or at least share with your younger self? I'll start with you and Dasha. So I, I guess I would have to say something a little different because like I said, I started this work so early, but I will tell my younger self that you have to be bold. You cannot be afraid. 
People are going to call you fast. They're going to call you all manner of things. And not because that has something to do with you. It has something to do with them. Right. And so that is what I will tell myself to stand firm in your truth, stand firm um, in who you are, because the work that you're doing is is going to be somewhere. And so that's what I would that's what I would tell myself. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of what you're doing. Don't be ashamed of what you're teaching. Yes, you're growing up in the church. However, the church needs to change, not you. Amen. Right. Mm -hmm. So that is what um, I, I would tell I would tell myself, just just keep going, just keep doing it. And your silence is not going to save you. You can't sit silent. You have you have to talk. You have to speak because what you're doing can possibly save the life of someone else. So that's what I would you know, tell my younger self. That was really powerful. Your silence is not going to save you. That's that's, yeah, I think Mother Lord, our Lord, you know, she says, you know, it's, you know, it's not going to save us. Yeah. And so we have to speak up. We have to be, we have to be bold. The system wants us to stay silent. Right. Because the system wants to survive and thrive. And so it survives and thrives off of silence and complicitness. Yeah. So Let's that's what I would say. Ladia, what would you tell your younger self when it comes to um, health and sexuality? Younger self, when it comes to health and sexuality, exercise your self advocacy, exercise your self efficacy. If it doesn't feel right, if you don't like it, say no and mean your no. Because mm -hmm. at that point, she wasn't. But you using your voice, continue to use it. Something's going to happen along the way. It's going to snatch your voice from you. Use it anyway. We're very thankful that you're using your voice today. So thankful. Dr. Linda, come yeah. to you. What would you tell my, my 70s self or my, yeah. <laughs> um, I would probably tell myself there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing, you know, you are beautiful and you, um, you know, you, your behavior, your well-being is not contingent on the well-being of others. Um, or your, yeah, your well-being is not contingent on the well-being of others. Um, and that not in a way. Yeah. Sorry. I lost myself for a second. But you you really um, need to put your mask on first and take care of yourself. Um, that piece. And then also, um, I think I would tell myself very clearly that the rules are made for you. And so don't get so caught up in trying to follow them because it's a setup. And that's probably like the most important message I would tell myself. So. That is huge. That is huge. Well, I want to give you guys also the opportunity to tell people how to follow you on social media. Um, I'll start with you, Dr. Linda, because what you what you're doing is so important. Obviously, we see from this conversation that we cannot we cannot be educated enough. Um, we cannot offer enough support. Uh, for this, for the agendas that you guys are working on. So let people know where they can follow you, where they can find more information um, for what you're working on. Yeah. So like I said, I'm kind of low tech, me personally, but you can follow the initiative, Black Women First initiative. Um, you can check us out on Target HIV. Um, you can follow um, us on Twitter. We have a Twitter link. You can also find us through the Black Women Health Imperative and AIDS United um, and then for me, you can find me at the BUSSW, Boston University <laughs> School of Social Work site, because I'm a little low tech, but now I want to get a Twitter handle so that I can listen to Windasha and talk to her. <laughs> so. Ladia, what about you? Share your social platform so people can make sure they're following you and tuned in. All social platforms, Ladia Joyce, and also my nonprofit, The Positive Experience Org on Instagram. I am launching my initiatives this year so follow 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 because it's geared towards us it's much needed so ladia joyce on all social media so platforms or the positive experience or all right and sensible sex part <laughs> 
So yes, you can follow me at the Sensible Sex Bird on Instagram, also on Facebook. You can follow me there if you're more interested in my um, academic work. Um, I'm at Kennesaw State University, um, Department of Health Promotion and Physical Education. So that's my academic side, like I am put my tie on, but for other work, um, the sensible sex word, um, dot com as well. So I'm um, the sensible sex expert on all my social media platforms. Well, Ladia, we are sending good vibes to you for your conversation coming up later tonight. Um, and I just want to remind everyone watching uh, to make sure that you follow the Black Women's Health Imperative on Instagram. If you go to their Instagram, you can find more about this conversation. You can go to the website. It's at BWHI, or if you want to type it in, it's at BLK Women's Health, Black Women's Health. Uh, go and follow them. And also, you want to definitely follow us on Rolling Out. We are the Urban Voice. We're definitely making sure that these type of conversations happen. Uh, Sisters with Superpowers is something that's been a part of Rolling Out's um, basically foundation because we want to make sure that we're always telling the stories of black women from our own from our own experience. So make sure that you follow both of those platforms. I want to thank all three of you for a very uh, insightful and candid conversation, one that was so needed and you all definitely stepped up to the plate and knocked it out and we're eternally grateful. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you. Of course. And thank you all for watching. Like I said, if there's more that you want to know, you can definitely go to uh, Black Women's Health Imperative and you'll be able to get in touch with all these ladies and find out more about how you can get involved and make sure at the end of all of this that you took the message of putting yourself first by any means necessary. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll definitely see you next time. This has been Crystal Jordan with Rolling Out Sisters with Superpowers, powered by the Black Women's Health Imperative.